All right. So welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Tonight, I have Trish Ahel Roberts. <laughs> Did I say that right? <laughs> no. Trish Agel. Well, okay. <laughs> You're close, though. <laughs> I heard all kinds of stuff, so that was pretty good. Oh, my God. All right. Trish Agel Roberts. <laughs> Agel. Agel. <laughs> It's just ah uh, and gel. Ah uh, gel. Like, so it's like gel. Gel. it's just like a fancy gel. It's like gel. <laughs> gel. Trish a uh, gel. A uh, gel. Yeah. <laughs> Roberts. What is that name? Is it um what is it? Is it Latin? So, <laughs> so it's it's um it's French. My mother was uh, born in St. Lucia, so her first language was French. Um, but then I changed the spelling because if I really spelled it the way she spelled it, then you'd really not be able to say it. So. Oh, nice. Listen, I just went to St. Lucia <laughs> in November. I Did you? loved it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. I mean, they weren't playing around with the COVID, but we just went to chill and just stay at one place and just, you know, enjoy. That's so nice because I've been wanting to travel, but. I know. I know. It was like a big thing. We were like, should we, should we not? And then we saw they had the lowest COVID numbers at that time. Mm -hmm. and, um, we just went ahead and did it. We stayed at a um, Airbnb that had a pool and everything. And we just like, you know, took precautions, followed the rules and we had a great time. Oh, I'm so jealous because yeah. I really, really do want to, um, to travel but I probably won't go anyplace until the spring yeah I mean hopefully by then things will be a little bit better all right so let me get into who Trish is so I'm going to read a little bit of her bio because I just think it's fabulous right so Trish is a self-actualization coach yoga and meditation instructor plant-based retreat organizer and Reiki practitioner she is the founder of Honey Butterflies LLC and Black Vegan Life and holds an MBA. So today we're going to talk about all the things that she's doing and how she discovered this passion. So welcome to the podcast, Trish. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Yes, it's going to be fun. So the first question I have to ask you is when you were a kid, what skill set did you have early on that is serving you now that back then you didn't realize was a skill? Ooh, you know what it is? I always got in trouble for talking too much <laughs> and nobody thought that was a skill. <laughs> and now it's like, oh my God, it's actually, you know, I'm not an introvert at all. And it's been coming in handy since I started my own business. Yeah, so sure. I mean, definitely. That is something that some people might say, you talk too much, you need to sit down and now look at, you need to be extroverted and talk. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so when, uh, no, okay. What was your occupation in corporate America before you became an entrepreneur? So I spent about eight years working as a corporate account manager for a telecom. So it was, you know, sales, business to business sales. And I used to sell to, um, to brokerage firms. So I kind of transitioned from that to being a financial advisor, actually working um, as, you know, selling financial services. So basically I was doing corporate sales the whole time when I was in corporate. Wow, but that's good too, because the financial ad advisor aspect helps you with your business, you know, probably with the financial stuff, you can look at it a little bit more objectively. When the money comes pouring in, I know exactly what to do with it. So yeah, <laughs> that, that, is, that is a good thing. <laughs> exactly. So now but I tell you one thing about one thing about sales is that you learn not to be scared to ask, you know, just to ask, yeah. like, I am not scared of someone telling me no. I just ask and they say whatever. And I'm like, okay, you know. I know, I'm still learning that. I have um, a beauty line. I sell lashes, lipsticks and um, shadows. And I am not the most um, like upfront, like, hey, would you like to buy something type of person? So I'm learning that um, you really just have to put yourself out there and ask. 
and it's really hard for me, but you got to Yeah. You just kind of got to get over getting your feelings hurt and just don't take it personally and just keep going. I know. Well, thanks, Trish. I, I, that's good. I learned something already today. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when were you the most unhappy in your life and what did you do to change for yourself? Hmm. When, when, when was I the most unhappy? Mm -hmm. Um, gosh, I've had a lot of ups and downs. So the, the most recent one that I, that I felt was a kind of a catalyst was back in 2010. Mm -hmm. I was working at a financial services firm. My boss was not the one who hired me. He was another person. And I just felt that he was very racist. Like he would look at me like I was disgusting. And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm so cute. <laughs> like, what are you saying? Like, what I'm not seeing. So we were not working out. And then my relationship wasn't working out. And um, I was a single mom, you know, my daughter was around nine. So like my thoughts of remarriage wasn't working out. Uh -huh. So that was a rough time. Um, and that was actually when I, I Googled meditation because I had always had this interest in Buddhism and meditation that was really unexplored. So I Googled meditation and I kind of stumbled into this meditation center out here in Atlanta. And that really changed my life. I learned so much. Um, and really, that was probably the beginning of my journey of really being able to teach other people how to use tools to be happy. Because um, I've always been kind of like, you know, an optimist, like I was kind of always pretty good on the happiness spectrum. But um, that was definitely a difficult time in my life. And um, what really turned it around was looking for resources, you know, and being open to that. Wow. Okay. So tell us, what is a self-actualization coach and what made you choose this specific area to, you know, um, study and, and help people in? Yeah. So I am a certified life coach mm -hmm. and self-actualization has just become like my life's mission because I feel like there's so much lost potential and it drives me crazy. You know, there are kids who are thrown away in school. You know, their teachers don't think they're ever gonna to amount to anything, so they don't even bother teaching to them. Or they're thrown away into prison systems where it's like, they're not gonna count, let's just, doesn't matter where they end up, they're never gonna be anything. Or they're, you know, attacked by police officers because police look at them and they say, you know what, this person's not anybody anyway, it doesn't matter how I treat them. Um, and then there are people who maybe were like me where I had talents that I was scared to put out into the world because. I didn't think I was gonna make money on it or I thought maybe somebody would think what I was doing was crazy. You know, so I had um, my own potentialities that I was not le letting free. Um, and I just had this idea one day, suppose like everybody lived to their potential. Like suppose we were all writing our music and singing our songs and doing the things that we were best at, we would have like this amazing world to live on, you know? Because people who are living to their full potential aren't angry, you know, we're not trying to fight. <laughs> you know, we're supporting each other. We're feeling like we're all adding to the equation and adding to, um, you know, society. Mm -hmm. So I just really, really am passionate about that. So when I went through, you know, my life coaching certification, they ask you what you want to specialize in and it just became self-actualization. Um, and then it's funny because I think it was so organic for me. I was working on it without knowing I was working on it. Mm -hmm. Like when I um, when I wrote um, my self-help memoir, which came out over the summer, it's called Thinking Outside the Chrysalis, Black mm -hmm. Woman's Guide for Spreading Her Wings. Um, I did that because I was planning a retreat and I thought I wanted to share this information with the retreat participants. So it became kind of these 12 drops of wisdom or 12 drops of nectar. Um, and as I put it together, I realize it's that's exactly what it is. It's like the path to self-actualization. It's putting all the pieces together. So I yeah. don't know. It just it just all fell into place. And it's such a it's such a rich feeling to be doing the work that you really, really want to do. So I'm excited. Yeah, I I I know it's 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 amazing. It's gotta be amazing, right? Every person that I talk to that feels like they are doing purpose-driven work, that is you know, they're very passionate about what they're doing and they love it. Um, so I really, that, that's what makes me love talking to you guys.
Yeah, so, and it's not strategic, you know, it, it just, it came from the heart. I, so, it's like an organic yeah. thing that just kind of folds together, like, you mm -hmm. know, I love it. So um, I was going to ask you, how did you come up with your 12-step approach to mind-blowing happiness program? So it, so it did start with the first book, but it, it was really, um, it sounds so weird when I say it, but like, I had been studying Buddhist philosophy for a while. Um, you know, I had been Christian for many years prior to that and went through this whole spiritual journey where I was like Catholic and atheist and Christian and doing all this stuff and <laughs> went onto this Buddhist path. And then also had been studying yoga, had gotten into life coaching, had been through my own kind of therapeutic journey with therapy and healing. Um, so I had started gathering so much information that I really wanted to share it. Um, and I started writing that book for these retreat participants, but I literally went to sleep and woke up like three o'clock in the morning with just these ideas. Mm -hmm. And it was just like the 10 chapters. So I wrote them down and I was like, okay, you know, I went back to sleep. And then later on, I added the other two um, and it became 12. But that was, I don't know, there were times when I really felt like, um, it was being channeled through me, you know, like when I had to write really fast to get it all down. Um, but that's that's kind of how it came together. So it came from different modalities, you know, that I had been studying in my own life and on my own journey. But there was also this, this kind of divine intervention piece that I think was, you know, added to the equation. Yeah, that's so funny because I interviewed someone who also shared a similar story with me. Actually, two people have shared a story like that with me. So that is just amazing when that, when you can be the recipient of that, you know? So it's pretty cool. But I, I think that that's probably um, not that uncommon when you find your path, you know, when you're yeah. doing the right work, so. Right. Oh my gosh, where's my book? God, come on. <laughs> Well, you know what? <laughs> Honestly, well, the other thing I'll tell you though is that one of the steps is give it away for free, which is about generosity, but it's really about giving your talents away. Because yeah. once you start to give it away, then you then you'll start finding your path. You know, you have to find your talents and yeah. then you have to put it out into the world. Um, because it's hard if you're holding on to them and waiting to know when to put it out. Mm -hmm. You know, like I started um organizing a vegan group out here in Atlanta. It's been six years. So you figure I was organizing, organizing that group for a good four and a half years before I went out on my own. But during the process of doing that, I had the opportunity to lead in that group, you know, and um, really start to find out what people wanted, you know, or what people thought I was good at. So yeah, keep working, it's gonna, it'll show up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, you're already doing great work now. Yeah, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to empower people with information about all of these different areas that they could possibly venture into if they're searching for more purpose driven, you know, work and um, just having you guys come on and share your journeys. I mean, hey, and I'm giving that away. <laughs> right. And you have to. One of the biggest things for me, and I don't know if you have a practice like this, is having some kind of stillness practice. You know, like it doesn't have to be like meditation was a, a big, a big kind of jaw dropper for me, but it doesn't have to be meditation, but it does need to be something where you get still and right. stop going through your grocery list in your head. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's like we have a to-do list, all these things that we're always thinking about all the time. Yeah. That you, when you settle your mind, then things start to kind of come to grow you. from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to, I've been trying to say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I just have not made time to do it. And um, I have another friend who is also on the podcast and he said something so funny. Like if you don't have time to meditate, then you have all the time you need to meditate, like <laughs> something like that. So yeah, like, it's like, if you don't have time to meditate, then you really need to meditate. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so you share a lot of self-love tips and you talk about teaching people how to fall in love with the real you. How can one identify that they are loving the real them as opposed to an imposter them? Because I feel like a lot of people, um, 
I don't know. I feel like a lot of people are not their authentic selves, you know, for whatever reason. So what's one way that we can realize that we're not being true to ourselves? What, what would you say? Uh, well, so, some of what I talk about um, in order to kind of uncover the real you and the authentic you is, um, first of all, figuring out the favorite things that you like to do. Mm-hmm. And you're not allowed to include food or sex. <laughs> <laughs> or alcohol. <laughs> it's like we all like to do that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so finding out really what you like to do. And and you do need to kind of disconnect it a little bit because sometimes we may have grown up in a family or something that everybody goes boating or something. So you think that that's your thing because you grew up doing it. Mm-hmm. So it does take some time, you know, to kind of maybe journal, that kind of thing. I teach it as an exercise mm-hmm. um, to figure out the things that you authentically like to do. And, um, and I talk about this, you know, in my books as well. And then the other thing is understanding what your masks are. And it's funny, I started writing about masks before COVID. So not a physical mask, <laughs> right? <laughs> but finding out um, what you maybe enhance, hide or wear. So if it's like makeup that you're wearing, like how you use lashes and stuff like that, knowing why you're wearing your lashes, you know, or knowing why you're wearing your makeup. You know, if you put on a corporate suit, understanding why you're wearing a corporate suit. If you're straightening your hair, why why are you straightening your hair? So it's not that you can't do those things, but just having an awareness of why you're doing those things. Because I know for me, um, and I think I've always been kind of philosophical and a little self-aware, but I think that um, I still had to think about like, okay, why am I doing certain things? Or am I even realizing that I'm showing up in certain places in a certain uniform because I wanna project a certain image. So just having those two awarenesses, you know, first what you like and then what you are um, enhancing, hiding or wearing, those two pieces together take you closer to um, a sense of self-awareness. And from, from there you can build affirmations about what you love about yourself. So, you know, the qualities that you love and then also identifying qualities that you want to develop. Because sometimes we may look at someone and say, you know, oh, I would really like to dance like her or speak like her or, you know, um, have boundaries like her, you know. Um, so, so really being able to identify those three components. And I then when you put it together, you, you can really build... Yeah, you can build self-love. Because my frustration, I guess, nowadays is there's a lot of talk about Mm self-love. You know, hashtag self-love. I love myself. But many times people are saying that, but they really haven't taken the time to really know who they are. Mm -hmm. Girl, you said a mouthful there. (laughs) (laughs) So healing is an important first step on the road to happiness. Mm -hmm. Why do you think people have such a hard time with getting to their happy? Hmm. Well, getting to their happy from healing, from a healing perspective? Yes. Like, okay, to be happy, you have to heal from all of the things that keep you trapped inside this place of, you know, unhappiness, right? So you have to do a lot of work, right, to heal. You said um, it. See, you said it. Well, yeah, because you got to do some work. And the thing is, you can be like, quote unquote, happy because I have a job, I have a spouse. And when I come home, I watch TV, you know, and that might be like, well, that's it. I'm happy. Right. But um, I think that we all have more in us than that. Mm -hmm. And it's just fear that keeps us from even daring to want more. So we might say, well, you know, I'm happy. I'm good. But I think that if we're really honest with ourselves, we all want a little bit more than just a job, a partner, and TV, you know, at the end of the day. So, um, but to get that, you know, it does start with healing. Um, I think that all Black people in the U.S. have at least race-based trauma, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. Um, Most of us have a little bit more than that. (laughs) Um, But it, it requires some effort you know, and it also requires experiencing our emotions. And if you're dealing with healing, that means you're going to probably, you know, kick up some emotions that were not good, you know, but um, 
there's a book that I love that I referenced in 12 Steps to Mind-Blowing Happiness. Mm -hmm. It's called My Grandmother's Hands. And the author, let me try not to mess up his name, Resma Menachem, talks about clean pain versus dirty pain. And dirty pain is the pain that you get when you're unhealed and you keep kind of blowing your trauma through other people who come into contact with you mm -hmm. versus clean pain is the pain of, um, of actually healing, you know? Um, sometimes I think of it, I don't know if you've had kids, you look like you're, do you? Okay. <laughs> you look like you're so young. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> But it makes me think of when I was having my daughter and my midwife or whoever it was, she said, um, you know, that childbirth is painful, but it's pain with a purpose. Yeah. You know, you know that, that you're experiencing this feeling for a reason and it'll be better when it's over as opposed to just being in pain all the time and never having it uh, resolve itself. So yeah, it requires some effort, but yeah. Girl, there's nothing like being healed and whole. I know, right? <laughs> and living your best life. What? Stop it. Purpose and passion. Listen. Yes, is worth it. Yes. So your book, Thinking Outside the Chrysalis. Am I saying that right? Yes, you are. <laughs> You're killing it. Girl, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> A Black Woman's Guide to Spreading Her Wings. Why did you write this book? And what do you want Black women to take from this book? So that book started off as being, um, I, you know, I wanted to write something for these retreat participants. Mm -hmm. I was planning this, um, you know, plant-based retreat that was supposed to take place in April of 2020 before the pandemic hit. Um, so it started off that way. And then when I first started writing it, um, I thought to myself, you know, are people going to really listen to what I'm talking about if I don't tell my story? So then I started telling my story as part of the book and it became what, you know, a self-help memoir. Um, and for me, I guess it was just a love letter to black women. You know, I write a lot about institutional racism that I've experienced. Um, I write about, um, you know, feeling comfortable in your own skin in a country that does not really love us the way that we should be loved, you know? Um, so yeah, it just felt really natural to um, kind of dedicate it to, to black women because we were just in a, we're in a unique situation. Yeah. You know, and, and we need to get loved on. And I think sometimes, you know, in our culture, there's this, there's this kind of conversation about women fighting each other and even more so with black women, you know, holding each other back or not supporting each other. And I've just never felt that way. You know, I grew up in a family, there were four girls and I've always just like had girlfriends and just love my girlfriends. So I just, I don't know. I just have always been really supportive of other black women. So I was happy That's to do amazing, that. amazing, Trish. You're lucky. <laughs> That's what I hear, but I <laughs> You're very lucky, but yeah, um, <laughs> I'm gonna leave that there. <laughs> well, I will say this though, um, there is like, I, sometimes I think of myself as like boundary girl mm -hmm. and I wrote a poem actually, I can't remember the whole thing, but there's a part where I say, saying no makes me happy and I can love you from afar. So like, <laughs> so like I am just not up for people's nonsense either. Right. And I, I, I don't have, pro I don't have a problem like separating myself because I just feel like I'm protecting my heart when I'm around like negative people or nastiness or jealousy. Like that's not for me. Yeah. Even if I love you, you could go do that in your corner and I'll just be over here feeling good. <laughs> you right. know, so. I'm like that too. I definitely have boundaries. And if I get bad vibes, I'm out. I don't care what you say those vibes are coming from. If every time I'm around you, I feel uncomfortable. Mm -mm, can't do it but I'm like I love friendship I love like supporting people having people support me and us like cheering each other on yeah very hard to find that it's to, to authentically have it like you know you might have someone say yeah girl I love you I'm down with you but they're like you right know, you know what I mean I've experienced that 
most of my life. My test is now, my test is when the phone rings and I look at my phone. That's when I know immediately. If I look at my phone and I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. then it's like, yeah, you probably need to, you <laughs> you need to drop that one from your circle. <laughs> Yes, and I have, and I do. So, and I'm probably looked at as like people probably say, oh, she's so like, she will cut everybody off, like, or whatever. But you know what? I'd rather be home with my husband and my child than to be out with people that I have to wonder if they really care for me or if this is real or not or whatever, you know? Like, so mm -mm, I'm good. I came in here by myself. Yeah, there's a, a Nipsey Hussle quote that I've been throwing around a lot where he says, um, if the people in your circle don't inspire you, it's not a circle, it's a cage. Yeah, that's a good one. I read that too. Yeah. Yeah, and I was, and you know, I really didn't follow him when he was alive, but I was oh. like, man, I was missing out. I yeah. know. You're gonna have to later you later you gotta tell me what I gotta listen to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> get me up to speed because I missed out on the whole thing I know me too I I caught I caught on right at the end you know so oh okay yeah I thought you were gonna give me insider no I still can because I I, you know I did my little research when I caught on and then you know this tragic thing happened but yeah yeah he was definitely a gem Mm -hmm. so yeah but I'm glad I'm not the only one. So we're here with that too, you know? <laughs> so let's talk about purpose, okay? Um, Can I say one, one more thing about the friend thing? Sure, you go? absolutely. Because <laughs> one thing is just popping in my head because I experienced it when I decided to start my business mm-hmm. is that sometimes when you make a big shift, yeah, then the people change. You know, like sometimes you have those moments where you might have to leave, let some let some yeah. folks fall behind. Absolutely. And don't feel bad because you make space for new people. Yes, you really do. People who are really supposed to be there. So that's the best thing. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's fact. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's talk about purpose. You talk about using journaling as a way to unleash your life's passion. How does this work and why do you think this works? Like um, doing the journaling and there was something else that you talked about too, that was very interesting. It was, um, let me look at my notes. Um, It's something else that you do with the journaling um, for helping people discover their passions. You know what it is, tell us. (laughs) Um, Well, (laughs) Well, so some of it I was talking about before, like those exercises that I was giving you, you would want to journal them. Um, and, and 12 Steps to Mind-Blowing Happiness is a journal of insights, quotes, and questions to juice up your journey. So it is really getting you dug into journaling because there's a lot of space in there to write. Mm-hmm. But what I learned about journaling, because a lot of times we think, well, what's the point of writing it down? I know what happened, you know? Yeah. But usually our thoughts are just kind of, swirling around in our head you know and like if somebody asks you what you ate last week Monday for dinner you have no idea um so journaling it does record it but it also does um it forces you to kind of organize your thoughts and make you think about things in a different way and with the like the prompts that I give both both books have prompts um Many times it's asking you questions that you may have never asked yourself before or asking you to think about things in a way that you've never thought about before. So, you know, going through those exercises can really help you, you know, identify what it is that you looking for that you're looking for. It's funny because before I had read, um, gosh. I had read The Purpose Driven Life. Do you remember that one? Yeah. You know that one, Rick Warren's Christian Christian book that I had read many years ago. And I remember reading it twice and I still didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. Although I think it speaks to the fact that people really want to find their purpose because yeah. it was a hugely successful book. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting. It didn't give you a place that I recall to kind of work through you know, what you were really trying to do. I mean, the main thing is discovering your um, your talents. 
oh, you know what? I didn't talk about that. Wait a minute. So one of the things that I talk about is working in the zone, you know, and how to identify your, what I call zone talents. So typically when you're working in the zone, that's when you are so into what you're doing and you feel so competent at what you're doing that you really kind of feel excited and ignited and you lose track of time, right? Um, you just feel really good doing what you're doing. So if you can pay attention to when you feel that way and what talents you have that put you in that place. So I think of it like, you know, Misty Copeland doing a pirouette or um, Serena. I don't know, Tupac rapping or, you know, people who yeah. are really, I took it way back just now. <laughs> But, you know, people who are really doing, like Barack Obama making a speech, you know, it's like people who are really in the groove doing their best work. So identifying when you feel that way and then trying to increase the amount of time you can spend feeling that way. So like if you're not getting it at work, like for me, I really feel that way when I write. And most of my jobs, I didn't have a lot of writing like that. So I might have wanted to write in my own time. Yeah. or volunteer right for other organizations you know for nonprofits and that kind of thing to give myself more exposure to getting into um identifying my passions and then i think over time with you know with stillness which you're gonna have to get still keisha yeah. <laughs> you're gonna have to eventually get still because that's when you get the aha moments yeah. where you'll figure out okay well i've been doing whatever it is say you were I don't know who's my example. Maybe let's go back to Misty Copeland, whatever. Well, she's not a good example because she was dancing for forever. But say you were doing something that was um, putting you in that feeling, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, say you were grant writing, I don't know. And you were doing that um, for a while. When you had that moment of meditation or maybe yoga nidra, which is like yogic sleep or restorative yoga, or just deciding to get still for a while, in that moment, you may have the aha moment where you remember the thing that allows you to do your passion. Does that make sense? Yes. You know, like I have all these aha moments, but they only happen when I'm still. Or sometimes when I'm sleeping, like I'll wake up, like what I told you about mm -hmm. before. Yeah, I, it does make sense. And I just wanna add that, um, that zone doesn't only have to be um, a space where you're making money or doing something like that. Like I have a friend who she's in that zone when she's cooking for her family and taking care of them. Like that is her euphoric, blissful place, right? Mm -hmm. And to some people, it might be like, oh, that's a lot of work. Mm -mm. Like, well, I don't want to, you know, but she is her happiest when she is serving her family, you know, her daughters, her husband and taking care of them. So just keep in mind that that place can be doing anything. It could be gardening. Yeah. You know, and many times it's not the place where we're making money. Cause usually, I mean, if you had parents like mine, they weren't going to tell me to go be a gardener. You know, it was like, you better get a degree with something on it and go get some benefits, you know? Um, but then when you think of people like uh, Martha Stewart or B Smith, Right. Or, or Rachel Ray, you know, these people who have really been able to bring passion and have been able to do well without having to, you know, do something that they don't want to do. Right. Now, now, you know, you can't always get it that way, right? We're not all going to be Rachel Ray. <laughs> no, <we're not. laughs> but you can be Rachel Ray on the weekends, you know, you can take a couple hours a week to focus on your passion or your side hustle, you know. Um, whatever it is that brings you more fulfillment. Yes, I agree. So anger is a terrible emotion. Give us some tips for controlling this emotion. <laughs> that is not a quote from me. <laughs> no, it's not. That's me. That's anger is, is not good. I mean, it, it can be good, but it, you know, usually when we get angry, we make bad decisions like, you know, in the moment. So what, give us three tips for, I don't know. Team. A little process for that. So yeah, I, I got something for you. But so what I like to say is anger is a lie. 
-hmm. Like anger is a lie. Like any decision you make when you're angry, you're right. It's going to be a bad decision because you know how they say you get blind with rage. Like you literally cannot see Mm -hmm. when you're angry. Um, In the book, I write about my first husband who was violent. And I could see his pupils dilate. Like he literally looked physically blind when he was angry. And I'm not a doctor, so I don't know all about how that works, but I just find it really interesting. Um, But even if you think of like an argument with your partner or your spouse, um, when you're angry with them, it's like you really can't even see the person that you fell in love with. All you see is this person who really annoys you, you know? So, um, Yes. So anger is definitely purposeless. And I do have a technique. It's a four-step technique to help you release anger. It's, I call it tame and reframe. So the first step is to acknowledge your anger. I like to think of it as like a lion that's sitting next to me because anger isn't really a part of you. You know, like some people think, well, I'm just an angry person. You know, they think it's like, part of who they are, but it's not. It just kind of shows up sometimes. Mm -hmm. So first acknowledge it. The next step is to take some breaths, right? You should get some oxygen to the brain so that you don't do anything crazy. Yeah. (laughs) So take some deep breaths, you know, it also brings down your stress level. Mm -hmm. And the third step, which is I think the most difficult to learn is to use your imagination and ignite your empathy. So you have to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the person who's driving you crazy, who cut you off, who called you out your name, who did whatever, um, or even the situation, right? You know, I wanted a sunny day, it's a cloudy day, whatever. Um, And then once you get to that place of like understanding, Mm -hmm. then you can go to the last step, which is constructive action. So instead of, you know, slamming doors and yelling at people or whatever, you can do something that's positive that will kind of change the the situation that you're in. And sometimes you have to be creative to figure out what that action is gonna be too. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I think the biggest problem is that we lose our creativity. Cause you know, when we're kids, we're all about, I could be an astronaut and I'm talking to my imaginary friend. And you know, after a while, our parents or society or whatever is like, stop it. No, you can't. (laughs) And then we kind of forget how to imagine, how to dream and how to be creative. So absolutely. All right. So what do you look forward to doing the most every day when you wake up? Oh, my goodness. Right now, I look forward to working. (laughs) It's crazy, right? I would have never thought I would have said that one day. But yeah, like right now, my work is my passion. And I just can't wait to get at it. Um, aside from that, I love getting outside. I wish I could do more of, you know, the stuff that I used to do. Like I'm not going into the yoga studio anymore or into the gym, but I'll go out for a run. Um, I'll do yoga in my home. So like, I enjoy that, but at least you're still keeping it up. Girl, I'm just trying to keep everything from falling off. (laughs) I have a choice. (laughs) I know it's hard. It's hard. So what keeps you up up, up at night as an entrepreneur? Hmm, what keeps me up at night? Hmm, I mean, I don't feel anything about entrepreneur life is keeping me up at night. I think what has been keeping me up at night lately has been what's going on in this country Mm -hmm. um, around hatred and anger. And I really feel like, I really feel like I need to get my voice out there because I feel like I have an alternative that people need to tap into because, um, yeah, it's just this this lack of empathy. Um, It makes it scary. I have a 20-year-old daughter. I don't know how old your kids are. I'm sure mine is older. But, you know, we want to have a world for for these little people to walk into um, and not one that's full of, violence and anger and jealousy and um what's the word I want to say not authentic what is that plastic people you know you want to have real authentic people like everybody has these filters and you know posting the highlights of their life you know and and it makes you 
it ends up making people feel really isolated. Like it's not okay to be yourself unless you're perfect, but nobody's perfect, you know? So if you kind of perpetuate that myth, then it makes the world like this really unsafe place for everyone. So I guess that's what keeps me up at night. I want the world to get itself together so that so that people can, <laughs> know. you know, so that people can have good lives. Yeah, I know it, it's, it's really sad and it's scary, but hopefully things will get better. Yeah, and you know how they get better is that we each individually have to make ourselves better. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So keep listening to the podcast, guys, because that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> so I know that you feel like you are doing purpose-driven work here in your life. So I'm not even going to ask you that because it's clear that you are doing your purpose-driven work. So I want you to share an oh hell no moment with us that has um, taught you something or changed your perspective on something in life. And you know what an oh hell no moment is, girl, when you be like, oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I think when I was thinking about talking to you, I was thinking of um, that first boss was an oh hell no moment. Hmm. Something and I feel like I already told that story now. Yeah. But <laughs> was there ever something that he actually did or said that made you feel like, Oh no, honey. Like You know what I think my oh hell no moment was? I think um I think before I quit before I finally quit to start my business, it was just um I don't know, I just had a moment where I was like, why am I still going to this job, having these fake work friends who don't really care about me? You know, like they're all smiling and pretending that they care about me. Um and I wasn't making money that I wanted to be making anyway. Right. So I was like, well, oh, hell no. I could be broke all by myself. You know? right. right, I don't need this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I tell you, oh my God, that was the best thing. And I'm not telling anybody to go quit their job. So don't come calling back saying, Trish, they quit your job. But, you know, yeah, you do have those pivotal moments where you have to... Um, you have to make a decision if you want to live just a little bit or if you want to live a lot, you know? Nice. All right, Trish. Well, tell us where we can buy your books and connect with you. Yeah. So my website is mindblowinghappiness.com. And it's all one word, mindblowinghappiness.com. And you can find me on Instagram or Facebook at mindblowinghappiness. And you can find me on Twitter at Trish Agel, which is Trish, A-H-J-E-L. She says it so much better, Agel. <laughs> hey, I got it. <laughs> All right. It was such a pleasure having you on, Trish. Thank you for coming on the podcast. And I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Keisha. <laughs> we'll talk soon. Yeah.